I served in Aransas Pass. It was a fishing village, but the fishing industry's gone. It left a big hollow deal there. It's nothing, uh, nothing filled it in but drug and poverty. So this community church I serve is First Christian Church of Aransas Pass. And some, a question I've asked myself, and maybe you've asked yourself too, if your church closed today, would the community or the surrounding area miss you? That's a pretty good question, isn't it? Well, we asked that and said, what are we going to do as a church? What are we going to do to be of service to this community? And we started our journey toward becoming a 50-50 church. And in case uh, you heard a little bit about it, and it there, that's a great description of it. Here it is. You see, every dollar that comes into the church, 50 cents of it stays in the church, and the other 50 cents goes outside the walls of the church. That's where we have got to. It was, it was a goal. We weren't always there. In 2012, Dr. Jimmy Cobb came to our church. We asked him to present to us, and he presented a uh, workshop called The Changing Church. And what we found was uh, most mainline churches, including the disciples, are in decline. It's no mystery. I think we knew that before we started. Dr. Cobb challenged us to look for ways to meet the needs of the community and take the church outside the walls. The result of this meeting was it set the tone for us being open to change. That's pretty big. In 2014, some members of First Christian Church and I attended a seminar in Central Christian in San Antonio, Texas. And its uh, focus was, what are, you, what are you doing as a church? What is your one in 10,000 mission for your church? And how do we capitalize on that one in 10,000? What we got to looking at is our deal is benevolence. Our church was big on benevolence. It's something we had a heart for. So we, we started developing that. A couple of the members and I found a book, and it's called Halftime by Bob Buford. Has anybody ever read that book? Halftime is about, it's about his life from success to significance. He had hit a point in his life where he had made all the money he needed to make. He had a business, but what's he going to do the last half of his life? And it was a great, great, great book on what do you do with your life? What is significant in your life? But what really hit me was the last chapter. In the last chapter, it surrounded the 50-50 concept. 50-50. And it was a corporate idea. What do you do as a corporate, as a church? How do you get out into the community? What do you do with the last 50%? Well, we took that as a goal. The challenge is to allocate 50% of the church's resources. That's time, energy, and money. 50% of it stays in the church. 50% of it goes outside the walls of the church. And the idea there is people need to see your faith in action, not just read about it. So the time, energy, and money used to operate the church is matched by the time, energy, and money outside the walls of the church. In 2015, we determined by calculating our time and our energy, and especially our money, we were at 37%. 37% of our monies coming into the church went outside the walls. So we were a 63-37 church. Money is a lot easier to calculate than time and energy, but we had to thumbnail the time and energy but money is the hardest thing to let go of. By 2016, we continued to focus and estimated that we were a 60-40 church, 60% 60 inside the church and 40% outside the church. The church was unified. What's well, getting everybody headed in the same direction. At our board meetings, we talked about, from that point on, what are we doing to meet our goal of being a 50-50 church? Are, we, are the decisions made in the board, do they support 50-50? We did this, and that was our mindset, to the point that it wasn't long after the hurricane, our sign, our marquee was destroyed. So I came up, and I thought, you know, I'd really, really like an electronic marquee because I get a little tired of going out in the snow and the cold changing my marquee. 
That's a joke. I live in South Texas. It doesn't snow there. Well, I told the board, the marquee, you know, we had the money. Let's get an electronic marquee. All my cool other uh, pastor friends have electronic marquees. I want one. And you know what they told me? Pastor, that doesn't meet our 50-50 goal. Darn it. I hate it when they do that. They turned it around. And I was so proud, and I was upset at the same time. I was so proud of them. They had it ingrained. So all decisions were made on becoming a 50-50 church. And my electronic marquee didn't make it, so we got a regular marquee. August 25th, 2017, something happened. A hurricane, a Category 4 hurricane hit the coast. Its eyes centered over Rockport and Aransas Pass. And as it moved through the area with 140 mile an hour winds, it devastated the area, blew homes apart, blew businesses apart. The, the whole area was a wreck. No power for weeks. Our only hospital was leveled and never, to this day, has not come back. But what it did for us, it presented an opportunity to make a difference in the community. It gave us an opportunity to use this 50-50 concept. There's a, another picture of something just a couple of blocks from the church, just some of the devastation. The culture of First Christian Church of Rans' past was geared toward going outside the walls prior to Hurricane Harvey. With the arrival of Hurricane Harvey, the church naturally seemed to move in the, in the outreach mode. Congregations infused with a purpose as a result of seeing the hurricane's impact on the community, we went forward in trying to make a difference. It's another pic of a house not too far from the church. This is what, what it looked like when you drove down the street. You'd, you'd see the devastation. August 27th, we set up an online giving fund through National Christian Foundation. We made calls outside the area that were affected. And August 27th, the church and financial chair and elders arranged a caravan of supplies to come into the community, into our church, so we could use it as an area where we could disperse supplies. And we contacted Week of Compassion, and we got together. August 31st, manpower and supplies began to roll into the church. Now, it's something, if you're in an area that's devastated by a hurricane, you get these people wanting to come help. If you don't have a structure set up, they're just there. If you don't have a place where the money can be dispersed, it's not doing you any good. But we had already set up the infrastructure. We set up an instant command. We used the NIM system, if any of you know what that is. We set up an instant command with a resource center. We, we gutted our uh, education building. We turned our fellowship hall into an instant command. We fellowshiped with other churches. We collaborated with them and with the local EMT, and we began to make a difference in the community. As money and manpower began to flow outside the walls of the church, guess what happened? Money flowed into the church. And as a result, over 80 families were assisted with monetary grants from this, this effort. A hundred families were assisted with debris removal. We brought in cherry pickers, we brought in backhoes, and we're able to move debris out of yards and get people back into their homes. We had chainsaws, we had hundreds of people coming in to volunteer during this duration with chainsaws, removing, cutting down trees and removing stumps. 6,000 man hours, 4,000 in the field, and about 2,000 in the incident command itself. And here's the note. Less than 10% of those families we helped were members of our church. That With this set, we're still in that mindset. We're going outside the walls of the church. We continue to reach outside the walls of the church into other ministries. We have the beacon of hope where we reach out to young people in the community with music and food, helping hands, help people in the area with uh, utilities and rent, helping hearts. We set up after attending a meeting uh, with a couple of our leaders in our church about what the trauma had done, what stress has done to people. We set up a, a licensed professional counselor at our church, and now we pay for people who come in and have counseling at our church. Also, uh, we interacted with a drug rehab, Shoreline Drug Rehab for teens and community men's fellowship. 
uh, grace house for women coming out of incarceration. These monies are going outside the church. We're ready now should another catastrophe hit. We're doing this day to day. But if something else happens, we're ready to move money outside the church. I know I'm preaching to the choir. All you guys are in Mission Fest. Okay, You're doing stuff like this. It's like talking to Noah about the flood, right? You guys are in the middle of this. And I really, really enjoy and appreciate what you guys have done, Andy. Getting this together, it means so much to me to see I'm surrounded by fellow uh, pastors, clergy, and, and uh, participants in the ministry of getting out and doing stuff for the kingdom of God. It, uh, just an example, last summer a hurricane hit the Florida Panhandle, Hurricane Michael. We were right away, already we found a church there, it was the Christian Church Panama City, Florida, and we were able to funnel money into them to help them put a new roof on their home, on their church. When all you focus on is keeping the doors of the church open, soon the church folds. When you focus on getting outside the walls of the church, not only do the walls stand up strong, but the people inside side know the heart of Jesus Christ. Well, that's our story, and it's a continuing story. Thank you. I'm going to take uh, privilege as a regional minister. David is one of my heroes. And I want you to talk about the roofer that <laughs> came in uh, shortly after Hurricane Harvey. Because yeah. one of the things that's important, one of the things that Terry Hort Owens emphasizes is that, that our work is not nonprofit work. It is church work. It is the work of Christ. And so I want to talk to David about, uh, share the story about a person um, who found more than a home in the work that they did. Okay. I have a long slide presentation for that, Andy, but I'll, I'll tell you the story. His name is Tony. Tony, 25 years old. Uh, he lived a few blocks from the church in a trailer home. The hurricane hit. It destroyed his trailer. He had no place to live. He was uh, just living after the hurricane. He was surviving on food that was brought by the Red Cross. One day, he was walking by the church, and he saw my wife, Charlotte, carrying some stuff in, and she, he asked her, do you know where the Red Cross is? Well, she handed him the bag. Start carrying this stuff in, son, and I'll tell you about it later. My husband's a pastor. Just go inside. And, and he did. He went inside. And we, had a, we were feeding our helpers, all of our uh, responders. He sat down, and he had barbecue. And then uh, I looked him up, and I, I talked to, to Tony. And I said, what's your issue, Tony? He said, my home's destroyed. I'm, I'm kind of living in the shambles of what's left. And he told me his story. And it was this is a story I've heard at that point in time probably a hundred times. And I said, Tony, what, what do you do for a living? He said, well, before the hurricane, I was a roofer. I said, really? A roofer? Well, at that time, we had brought a guy in from Dallas, a brother in Christ, that brought his construction company in from Dallas and was helping people uh, with roofs. And he was... He walked in, I got Tony, and I introduced him to Jay, and Jay and him got together. He hired him that day, put him up that night, worked for him all through the hurricane, and now he's at San Antonio. But more than that, okay, he's working with Jay. This is the next couple of days, and he asked him, you know, you went to this church. Do you know Jesus? And he said, yeah, I, I know Jesus. He's that guy in the Bible. I read about that guy. He says, do you really know Jesus? He says, I guess I don't. We'll talk to Pastor David. Well, he did that next Sunday. We talked, and Tony accepted Christ, and we baptized him there in the church the next week. And Tony's doing great. He went, <laughs> he came looking for a place for the night to stay, and he found a place in eternity. That's a, that's a good story, isn't it?